So hello, this is an introduction to inductive reasoning. So in this tutorial, I'm going to give a brief overview of different types of reasoning before looking at different forms of inductive reasoning in particular. I'll explain a deep philosophical worry about induction and then conclude with some implications for scientific reasoning. So consider the following argument. Premise one, if aspirin is effective, then it will make you hungry. Premise two, Aspirin does not make you hungry. Conclusion, therefore, aspirin is not effective. Should we accept this conclusion? So for starters, we might ask whether the argument is valid. Here's a breakdown of the argument structure. So if P, then Q, not Q, therefore, not P. So as explained in the tutorial on deduction, arguments that follow this form are called falsification via modus tollens. So the structure of this argument is valid. That is, if the premises are true, then the conclusion must be true. But in this case, we also need to ask whether this argument is sound. So are all the premises true as well? And so when we look at them, the first premise seems dubious, because aspirin is supposed to relieve pain, not make you hungry. So even though the argument has a valid structure, the argument is not sound, because one of the premises is false. As a result, we should not accept the conclusion. Now here's a slightly different argument. Premise one, the first six eggs in the carton were rotten. Premise two, all the eggs in the carton have the same expiration date. Conclusion, therefore, the seventh egg in the carton will also be rotten. Should we accept this conclusion? This piece of reasoning seems very sensible. After all, it seems very likely after examining the first six eggs that the seventh egg will be rotten too. But note that this argument differs in an, important, in an important way from the first one. Even if both premises are true, it may still be the case that the seventh egg in the carton is not rotten. In other words, the premises here do not logically entail the conclusion. Hence, this is not a deductive inference. It is an inductive one. In an inductive inference, we move from premises about things we have examined to conclusions about things we have not yet examined. So to quickly recap, the first argument we considered was deductive, and the second one was inductive. In, inducti in deductive reasoning, the truth of the premises guarantees the truth of the conclusion. In inductive reasoning, the truth of the premises provides evidence for the truth of the conclusion, but it doesn't guarantee it's true. And just to quickly flag it, in another form of reasoning called abductive reasoning, inferences are made to the best explanation that accounts for certain observations. So abductive reasoning is going to be the topic of the next tutorial, but I just wanted to make a quick note of it and contrast it to inductive and deductive reasoning. So in the remainder of this tutorial, I'm going to focus specifically on induction, and I'm going to walk through some examples. So we use inductive reasoning all the time. We use it in everyday life. For example, I'm confident my phone will not explode when I make a call. Why do I believe this claim? Well, up until now, my phone has not exploded when I made a call. Then I made an inference. My phone will not explode when I make a call this time. And therefore, I'm confident my phone will not explode when I make a call. Because this reasoning is inductive though, the premises do not entail the conclusion. So it's possible that my phone will burst into flames the next time I make a call, despite never happening before. Nonetheless, my past experiences suggest that this is unlikely. They provide evidence for the conclusion that my phone is unlikely to burst into flames when I make a call. We also use induction when reasoning about statistics. For example, you might see a claim like this. Governor Bob will win the election. Now, how did one arrive at this conclusion? Well, suppose that 55% of sampled voters say they will vote for Governor Bob. Then from this, an inference is made. Governor Bob will, will receive 55% of the vote in the real election. And so we conclude that Governor Bob will win the election. Here, it is important to carefully assess the assumptions that these inferences rely upon to be true. For example, in the first inference from 55% um, of sampled voters to, um, from 55% of sampled voters say they will vote for Governor Bob to, therefore Bo Governor Bob will actually receive 55% of the vote uh, we, need to be, we need to ask whether or not the voters sampled were actually representative of the general population. 
we need to ask whether or not enough people were sampled. And we also need to consider whether or not people will change their mind about who they're going to vote for between being sampled and the actual election. Notice that whether the inductive inference holds true will depend on all of these implicit assumptions. So scientists use inductive reasoning all the time. Here's an observation that was once made. All people diagnosed with Down syndrome thus far have trisomy 21, which means that they have three chromosome 21s. So here's a visualization of chromosomes called a karyotype, and we can see in the blue circle that this individual with Down syndrome has three um, chromosome 21s. Then scientists use inductive reasoning to conclude that all people with Down syndrome have trisomy 21, including those that they have not yet examined. So the observation of the scientists provides evidence for this conclusion. However, because this is an inductive inference, it is possible that this conclusion is false. And in fact, it turns out to be false. So a small proportion of people with Down syndrome have what's called the translocation Down syndrome, where they only have two chromosome 21, but there's an extra piece of chromosome attached to another one. In this case, there's an extra piece indicated by the red arrow attached to chromosome 14. So stepping back, this is an inductive inference in which we moved from a sample, namely people with Down syndrome observed thus far, to draw a conclusion about a population, namely all people with Down syndrome. So here's another example. Most people's eye infections are cured with an antibiotic. Now imagine your friend Mary comes in with her eye looking like this, and you diagnose Mary with an eye infection. It would then be natural to make the following inductive inference. Mary's eye infection will be cured with an antibiotic. Again, both observations provide evidence for this conclusion. However, even if most people's eye infections are cured with an antibiotic, and even if Mary has an eye infection, it does not necessarily follow that her eye infection will be cured with an antibiotic. So again, stepping back a little bit, this is an inductive inference in which we moved from a population level claim namely most people's treatment for eye infections, to draw a conclusion about an individual, namely Mary's eye infection treatment. So I think it's worth expanding a little bit on the former points raised. So in practice, a claim such as most people's eye infections are cured with an antibiotic actually means something like this. Studies show that eye infections are cured with an antibiotic. So a physician might make a clinical inference which moves from the scientific evidence to an individual prediction about her patient. But it's really worth pointing out here that there are two inductive inferences involved here. So the first inference involves moving from a trial population in a study to the actual target population for treatment. For example, is the intended population for treatment the same age as the trial participants? It may be that differently aged people respond differently to treatment. And if this is true, then Mary's physician must ensure that the scientific evidence generalizes the people like Mary by checking she is a similar age to the trial participants. But there's also a further inference that's going on here. The second inference involves moving from the target population to a particular individual. For example, even if the scientific evidence generalizes the people like Mary based on her age, Mary may still differ in relevant ways from the target population. For example, Mary may have used more antibiotics in the past than the average person, and hence, she might not respond as well to antibiotic treatment. And so if this is true, then Mary's physician must also ensure that the scientific evidence about the target population is individualized to Mary's particular circumstances. The takeaway is this. Often there are many inductive inferences embedded in what looks to be a single inference. And so when we're evaluating inductive inferences, it's crucial to assess each step involved in arriving at a conclusion. So I wanna talk very briefly about a deep worry lurking in the background here. And this is David Hume's problem of induction. So you might be wondering what all the fuss is about with induction. You know, of course it's true that we use induction all the time, but sometimes it's fallible. But you might be wondering, well, so what? You know, we, we might not know for certain, for absolute certain, the sun is going to rise tomorrow, but there's still good reason for thinking that it will. Lurking in the background here, though, is a really deep philosophical worry. The 18th century Scottish philosopher David Hume argued that 
induction actually cannot be rationally justified at all. So Hume noted that whenever we make inductive inferences, we rely on an assumption, on an assumption he called the uniformity of nature assumption. To understand what he meant, recall our previous example in which I am confident my phone will not explode when I make a call. I justified this based on my past experiences. And in this case, and as well as most all cases of induction, our reasoning depends on the assumption that things we have not examined will be similar in the relevant ways to things of the same sort that we have examined. So because my phone has not exploded in the past, I infer it will also not explode in the future. Hume's worry concerned how we know that this uniformity of nature assumption is true, because this is the assumption that underwrites all inductive inferences. Now, as, a, as an exercise, we might consider trying to find good evidence to justify its truth. We might say, well, this assumption is largely held true up till now, so surely that gives us good grounds for thinking it is true. But this would not actually establish the truth of the uniformity of nature assumption. After all, we can't point out that nature has been uniform in the past to justify that nature is going to be uniform in the future. This is because this is itself an inductive argument that depends on this, the uniformity of nature assumption. So in other words, an argument that assumes the uniformity of nature assumption is true from the outset can't prove that the uniformity of nature assumption is true. This would just be reasoning in a circle. So where does this leave us? Hume's problem of induction is a deep worry, and philosophers disagree about whether it has been adequately resolved. For our purposes, it explains why inductive reasoning is fallible, even when all of the premises in an inductive argument are true. So this is the key difference from deductive reasoning, in which if the premises are true, the conclusion must follow. Even so, inductive reasoning is a powerful tool for reasoning about the world that scientists use all the time. How can inductive inferences be strengthened? Well, first, we can examine the type of inductive inference. Are we moving from a sample to draw a conclusion about the general population? Are we making an inference about an individual based on population level knowledge? Second, we can assess the assumptions required for inferences to be sound. Recall how in our example of voter polling, we needed to ensure that the voter sample was representative and that it was large enough in order for the conclusion to be plausible. Third, we can assess each individual step embedded in an inference. For example, when moving from scientific evidence to individual predictions, there are often many distinct inferences involved. Finally, we can be mindful of how the premises relate to the conclusion. For example, does each premise actually provide evidence to increase your confidence in the conclusion? I hope this tutorial has been helpful. Thanks for watching. Hey guys, this is Glenn. Thanks so much for listening to this most recent episode of the Philosophy of Data Science. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please consider leaving a like, a comment, and hitting that subscribe and bell button. We're a small channel and every bit helps. If you have a lab, a department, some students or some colleagues who you think would enjoy this episode, please consider sending it along. Again, every bit helps and we really appreciate your word of mouth. Our next episode on the Philosophy of Data Science will be coming out 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Wednesday of next week. So we look forward to seeing you then. But if you can't wait to get more data science, machine learning, and statistical content, feel free to look around the rest of the channel. We have a large number of playlists, including things like machine learning for healthcare, uh, ethics and AI, and things like that. So give a look around. There's plenty more content for you to enjoy. You can also check out our website to not only see past episodes, but what's coming up and see who our sponsors are. Thank you to our sponsors for your support. Now, while the views discussed on the show typically range between extraordinary and mind-blowing, the stated views don't necessarily represent those of the host, our sponsors, my employer, your employer, the speaker's employer, or anyone else not saying those words. And as always, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. See you next week.